Welcome to Food Psych, a weekly podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, and body liberation. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm a registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor. Join me as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food and their bodies. Hey there, welcome to episode 120 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with Lindsay Averill, a filmmaker, writer, and activist who dedicates her life to ending the hateful relationships people have with their bodies and changing the national conversation about body image so that it focuses on the effect the very real issues of bias and systemic prejudice have on people. Her documentary, Fatitude, helps illuminate the harsh realities of fat shaming and size discrimination and shows us how we can help change that. It's got interviews with so many amazing folks in the fat acceptance and body liberation movements, including many people who've been on this podcast. So I'm so excited to share my conversation with Lindsay about the film and a whole lot more in just a moment. Today's listener question is from a listener named Claire who writes, as someone who has recently hit a breaking point and realized that my relationship with food is unhealthy, finding your podcast has been eye-opening and so helpful in at least making me feel like I'm not alone with these struggles. So thank you for being honest, having great guests, and hosting these discussions. I struggle with binge eating, but I'm in a smaller body, and I really enjoy working out and physical activity. I've not been able to figure out what triggers my binges, but do know that people commenting on my body does not help my mental state around food. I eat X number of calories a day in sweets and don't gain weight, but just because it's not changing my weight doesn't mean I want or need to eat like this. More often than not, it makes me feel ashamed, guilty, and physically awful, and I'm aware that consuming this much sugar daily could lead to serious health effects. I went to my doctor after my breaking point on a night where I quote-unquote came to in a pile of candy and cookie wrappers and a serious case of self-hatred. She told me some very triggering advice, but I insisted that she refer me to a therapist, which I believe is the correct move. However, I'd be curious to hear what some of the best ways you think are to ride out a food urge. While I've tried simply giving myself permission to eat what I want when I want, one piece of chocolate always seems to turn into so many I feel like I will be physically sick. Are there some trigger foods that you just never really will be okay around? So thanks, Claire, for that great question. And before I answer, just my standard disclaimer that these answers are for informational and educational purposes only and aren't a substitute for individual medical or mental health advice. So, yeah, I think the sort of main points I want to highlight here are, number one, no, there aren't trigger foods that you'll just never be okay around. I really believe that all foods fit. All foods belong. You don't have to have restrictions or deprivation around any particular foods. It's about your relationship with food and healing that so that you can be comfortable having one piece of chocolate if you want or however many pieces of chocolate that you want, right? Without feeling like you're losing control and ending up really uncomfortable or coming to in a pile of wrappers because that does not sound fun. And I can very much understand why that is causing Causing you shame and angst. Because, yeah, so the way that our society is, you know, if you're binge eating, but you're still in a smaller body and you're getting compliments about your body or people are saying that you look great or whatever, like that's not helpful. And it doesn't address what's actually going on in your relationship with food, which is really problematic no matter what your body size is, right? So I would say that thinking about restricting these foods is not helpful and thinking about riding out the urge is not as helpful as thinking about what you could do to sort of structure your day so that you don't actually end up overeating sweets when you finally do have access to them. And the biggest thing that I see, the biggest thing that comes up for my clients and the people I work with is that they're not eating enough at regular meals and snacks. And so, you know, this unconscious, like subtle level of restriction where you're not eating as much as you really want, you're serving yourself what you think, quote unquote, should be an appropriate portion size for meals and snacks, but actually it's not enough food. And so you're building up a deficit throughout the day. And then when you finally do have access to the sweets and candy, it feels like a free for all. And actually the fact that you're eating so many of those sweets as opposed to eating that same amount in regular food tells me that maybe you just need to be adding a lot more 
regular food to your life. And it might feel uncomfortable and it might challenge some of those unconscious restrictive beliefs that you have. So just think about it before you do it, but like wrestle with this idea of what if I ate double the size of meal right now? What if I ate significantly more at this snack or had a snack where I wouldn't have had one before? What if I added to every single eating opportunity, eating eating occasion throughout the day and made sure I have many eating occasions throughout the day where I'm getting my needs met at a subtler level, right? Like meeting your needs so that you don't get to this extreme level of hunger or frenzy around food where sugar and sweets is the only answer. And the reason people really get to that frenzied state around sugar and sweets usually is twofold. One is physical deprivation, which I was just talking about. So not eating enough throughout the day, being at this sort of low level of restriction constantly. And you said that you like physical activity and movement. And so I'm wondering if you're moving your body a lot and it just is needing a lot to refuel itself, but rather than giving it as much as it really needs, as much as it's asking for, you're restricting it because you think you quote unquote shouldn't be eating so much. So that's one thing. So, you know, sort of dialing it back on the physical activity could be helpful and also increasing the amount of food that you eat and the amount of meals and snacks that you eat rather than just the sweets, right? The other piece that contributes to binges like this is usually mental deprivation, right? Telling yourself that these foods are off limits, telling yourself that these foods are going to end in a binge. So those two things work together, the physical deprivation and the mental deprivation to create a situation in which you feel utterly compelled towards these foods and extremely guilty and shameful for starting to eat them, for wanting to eat them, for ending up binging on them, for, you know, you feel out of control and then you feel ashamed, right? And so then that increases the sense of psychological deprivation because when you're telling yourself these foods are bad, these foods always end up in a binge, I can't control myself around these foods, What does that do? It demonizes these foods, right? It makes them seem like they're going to get taken away from you or they're bad or there's something wrong with them. And so you're not going to be able to have them. And therefore, this sort of last supper mentality is really ignited. This idea of like, oh, my God, this might be my last time with these sweets because I'm probably going to have to cut them out, right? And in fact, no, you're not going to have to cut them out, right? So if you can address both the physical deprivation and the psychological deprivation that are going on here, that will really help you come to a place of neutrality with sweets. So you feel like, okay, I can have these whenever I want. I could also have a satisfying meal or snack right here. What do I feel in the mood for? What's really calling to me right now? What flavors am I interested in? What textures, what temperatures, what type of meal or snack? Is it meal hungry? Am I snack hungry? You know, All of these questions that are sort of intuitive eating questions that you can ask yourself about food within the context of, which is also a big principle of intuitive eating, full unconditional permission to eat whatever you want, right? And so truly unconditional means looking at those subtle ways that you're restricting yourself, looking at whether you're not allowing yourself to eat enough at meals and snacks, and really getting clear on where that deprivation mindset is still tripping you up. And so I think if you work on those two things, you'll definitely get to a place of ease and neutrality with sweets and with all foods. So, of course, that being said, much easier said than done, right? Most of my clients who work with me on this stuff, it takes months to get through all of this, to troubleshoot, to work through everything. And so working with a professional is a really, really good idea here. It's great that you have your therapist and hopefully your therapist understands intuitive eating and is able to help you with the mindset stuff around full permission to eat. If it's not a therapist who understands intuitive eating and health at every size, I would really encourage you to find one who does and also to work with a dietitian who understands intuitive eating and health at every size as well or an intuitive eating coach, right? Someone that can actually help you with the nitty gritty of your relationship with food and what's coming up for you when you're choosing foods on a daily basis. So I have a coaching program that addresses this, an intuitive eating coaching program. I also have an intuitive eating online course that might be helpful for you. You can check that out on my website, christyharrison.com. And then there's also the Intuitive Eating Certified Counselors Directory, which I'm also in, but that's at intuitiveeating.org, 
I believe, or maybe I think it's intuitiveeating.org or intuitiveeating.com. I think they both redirect to the same place, but look at their certified counselors directory there and you could find a counselor in your area if you'd like to work with someone in person. So that would be my recommendation, you know, just work on easing up the restrictions in other areas of your relationship with food, right? Thinking about eating enough and really being satisfied and full at all your meals and snacks and not demonizing the sweets because really a healthy, balanced relationship with food, you know, an intuitive and health at every size relationship with food can include literally all foods. Like there's nothing you have to fear. There's nothing you have to make off limits. So I hope that helps. And if you want to submit your own question for a chance to have it answered on an upcoming episode, visit christyharrison.com slash questions. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. We're brought to you today by Care.com. Why spend your precious weekend time cleaning, driving, or dog walking? Let Care.com help you handle everyday tasks so you can spend more time with your family. With access to 8.6 million caregivers across 16 countries, Care.com is the world's largest digital marketplace for finding and managing family care. You can find, book, and pay sitters, nannies, housekeepers, dog walkers, senior care, tutors, and a lot more all in one place. Whether you need childcare while you're at work or want to line up a date night sitter, using care.com makes life simpler for families everywhere, full-time, part-time, anytime. They even provide access to a variety of background check options that you can purchase to help you make the best hiring decision. You can join for free as a basic member and start searching for great local caregivers today. Once you upgrade to a premium membership, you can reach out to them, schedule interviews, and pay for care online or through the app. To me, that's the best part, being able to manage everything in one place. I just have so much going on in my online life, you know, between podcast stuff and my coaching practice and courses and then managing a bunch of social media accounts and coordinating everything with my staff. It's like a black hole in my email inbox. I seriously dread going in there sometimes. So thankfully, Care.com makes it really easy to find and book great people to help with household tasks without even having to open my email. To save 30% off a Care.com premium membership, visit care.com slash psych and subscribe. That's P-S-Y-C-H like our name, care.com slash psych. I also want to share a few resources that I love for helping you improve your relationship with food. The first is my free audio guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Finding Peace and Freedom with Food. This is my quick start guide to intuitive eating and health at every size. So if you're looking for some practical tips to launch your anti-diet journey, this is the place to go. Head over to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it, or you can text the word seven strategies, all one word, to the phone number 44222. That's the number seven and the word strategies to phone number 44222. The second resource I want to share is my online course, which I mentioned, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. It's a 13-week program that I created to really take a deep dive into all the principles of intuitive eating and to help you move past the areas where people tend to get stuck when they try to do it on their own. I'll show you how to recognize the diet mentality even in its subtle forms and how to start substituting non-diet thoughts instead. I'll share my secrets to making food and exercise choices from a place of self-care rather than self-control, and I'll also teach you how to navigate emotional eating and stop alternating between restriction and overeating. And you'll learn so much more from this course. Check out what a few participants have had to say. This first one is from a participant named Christina who writes, The gratitude that I feel for Christy, her team, and the Facebook group cannot even be put into words right now. I'm at a place that I never imagined was actually possible for me. It's amazing, liberating, humbling, and exhilarating. This course saved me. It gave me such a deep understanding of intuitive eating as well as of myself. I gave up dieting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then a participant named Kathy said, every week I learn something new about me. Every week I have greater peace. I wouldn't change a thing. So if you'd like to join these folks on this intuitive eating journey, go to christyharrison.com slash course to learn more and sign up. That's christyharrison.com slash course. And now without any further ado, let's go talk to Lindsay Averill. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. So my relationship with food growing up, I think is somewhat traditional, uh, meaning I was a a kid who was sort of culturally understood as fat by the time I was six. 
And while my parents are, which this I think is unusual, my parents are incredibly supportive and were always instilling confidence in me. But I came home from school by the time I was six years old asking to lose weight and be put on a diet. Hmm. Did you get that idea from teasing from other kids or? You know, to be honest with you, I don't, with total clarity, remember what spurred that feeling. I'm sure it had to do with teasing, but I weighed, I would say, honestly, probably not more than pounds more than than other children, but pounds in other in a small child can seem significant. And so I was understood as fat. I was definitely understood as different than my peers. And I didn't want to be. And so, you know, my father is a doctor and my my parents, again, who adore me, felt they were doing the right thing by taking me to see a nutritionist at age six. What was that experience like? To be honest, you don't have the framework for any of these things. It was the beginning of diet cycling for me in my life. So I was... I would say that from the time I was six until I was 30, I was always on a diet. And of course, you know, in a fairly traditional sense, I would diet and lose pounds and then I would stop dieting and gain pounds, right? And most often when I gained pounds, I would gain more pounds than I lost because when you starve your body, your body's reaction to starving is to pack on weight because it thinks it's starving. So it's going to store fat cells and and nutrients for the next time it's starving. Exactly. But all of that said, I think through most of my sort of youth and teenage years, my relationship with food was not that, it didn't qualify as an eating disorder. Uh, It may be qualified as disordered eating. And then In my late 20s and early 30s, I think I progressed. And I think this happens to a lot of people having an eating disorder that went unacknowledged because I was living in a fat body. So I had reached a point where my caloric intake was very, very low. And I was literally trying to starve myself thin. So, you know, I had gotten to the point where I was practicing just really unhealthy behaviors. And in Fatitude, Deb Burgard, who is a psychologist from the West Coast, talks about how when we look at at anorexia, we have a tendency to look at that person with anorexia and think, oh my God, you're jumping on and off the scale. You're recording everything you eat. You're worrying about every morsel and calorie that you put in your mouth. We need to help you, people, person with an eating disorder. But we prescribe that behavior to someone living in a fat body and don't recognize that we're prescribing what we're calling mental illness to people. And the only difference is people's body size to start out. Exactly. Right. So, and when you're living in a fat body and you're behaving that way, they look at you and say, Oh God, you're amazing. You're doing everything you're supposed to do, but you're sick. Yeah. Body is sick. You're not giving it enough nutrients. So your metabolism is slowing down. You have bouts of depression. You have all these, you know, you're not giving your body the right nutrients to ke- so that it's making the right chemicals so that it's taking care of itself. Right. You're having a lot of the same mental symptoms and, and physical symptoms too of someone with. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, as we know that people who progress in these cycles of disordered eating, they get worse. They don't get better. So as you progress further and you start thinking that you're, you start to see, you know, bouts of depression and despair because you can't understand you're doing everything right. Why are you not a thin person? And because being a thin person is being held up as the thing that's going to make you feel happy. And of course, that's like saying, of course, people are going to disagree with me, but that like, if I had all the money in the world, I would be happy. And the truth of the matter is happiness is something that you have to bring from within yourself, from inside to yourself. You don't have to attain something from outside in the world or or a particular physical shape in order to enable happiness. Happiness is a choice, not a an acquired thing. Yeah, so well said. 
I mean, and I think that that analogy of wealth is really one that people can understand. It's like, it's pretty sort of well known that there are some really miserable rich people and some people in abject poverty who can be happy because they choose to. And and that, you know, obviously it's not as simple as that, but like there is a huge element of choice to your happiness. And yet with body size, it's like we're so brainwashed, we're so conditioned to think like, no, but it it really will only be possible in this type of body. And I have to just put everything in my life on hold until I attain that. Right. Yeah. So how did you come out of that? Hmm. <laughs> well, I think the way that I came out of that was a slow journey. I'm not someone who in particular went through treatment. So I didn't have a treatment with a psychologist or through any kind of a recovery program. I started to recognize in my own life that I was not happy, right? And I also started to recognize that I was loved, right? So I had, I was married. I have a husband who I adore. I have a family I adore. And I was looking around and thinking, my life is pretty good. Why am I so miserable, <laughs> right? And I started at the same time that I was sort of having this epiphany for myself, I started to study for my PhD. And I was studying under a, an incredible woman whose name is Dr. Jane Caputi, and she's an Americanist and a feminist. And she, you know, we were learning about popular culture and representations of bodies and, and, you know, sexism and racism and economic suffering and all the elements of social justice in my PhD program. And I started to recognize the comparisons between these elements like sexism and what I would call fat phobia or weightism, and this understanding that I was living in a world that was prejudice against my body size, and that that kind of prejudice could also be causing some of this misery I was feeling. And there was actually a moment where another student looked at me and she had brought, she brought in brownies to school. And she was like, do you want one of these? Because I never know when you're on a diet when you're not. And I don't even think she'd know that was a moment of epiphany for me, but it hadn't even occurred to me that other people noticed my eating behaviors. There were all these pieces coming together. And the, you know, the last one was that I started, I wrote a, my first paper about fat studies and I didn't know that that field existed. And, and my mentor had gone to a conference and heard somebody talk about fat studies. And she had said to me, I think you might be interested in this there. I know there's this one book, go look at this one book. And it was the fat studies anthology. And then, and, and I, I think that's, was the first book I ran into. And I, I'd never seen anything by Marilyn Wan. I'd never, I'd never seen the fattosphere. I'd ne- none of that <laughs> was present in my life yet, but I had this one book where I start, I started to realize, Hey, it's not just me. That's recognizing this as a space of injustice, there's like a whole bunch of people who get this. And so I started to do research and study that. And I, as I, you know, the more research I did, the more I sort of fell down the rabbit hole in terms of all these elements, like the fatosphere, the fat blogosphere, you know, all the, the, the fat activism that was going on on the West coast and, and sporadically across the United States. And I started to read books on the nature of health and, and dieting and what it does to your metabolism. And I, I, you know, slowly made these decisions like, okay, I'm not going to diet. Okay. Maybe I'm always going to be fat. Okay. You know, like, and one after the other, I started to check these boxes and I, you know, and the, and the weird thing is that as I checked these boxes, I seem to stop feeling not, I guess it's not weird, but I seem to stop being oppressed and feeling upset about the nature of my body. And I started to embrace my body and recognize that I lived with this husband who was madly in love with me, who always was after me and interested in me sexually. And I like all these perceived problems in my life were imaginary. I told this story a couple of times before, but I was, we were driving on the highway and I was in the process of like getting healthier. And I, and I looked at this billboard on the highway and the billboard was like, an, you know, I live in South Florida. So the billboard was like a woman in a white bikini lying on the beach. I don't even know what it was advertising, but I looked at him and I said, you know, see, that's the thing is like, I never got to be that. I never got to have that. And I probably never will. And, you know, and I was talking about being her body lying comfortably on the beach. 
And the truth is today, I know I have no idea if she was even comfortable on that beach. right? But, but in that moment, he looked at me and he said, well, well, what did she have that you didn't have? And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, did you have like friends that you love and adore? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, did you go to the prom and date guys and life experience? And it was just this like lightning moment for me where I thought to myself, nothing. I did everything. I've been madly in love. I've been, you know, I've acted on a stage. I've sung in public. I've pursued a PhD degree. I've, you know, like I live a pretty privileged life, <laughs> right? And in the midst of it all, somehow not being in a bikini on a beach was, was the issue. Like what? Cause I, cause today I've done that too. What, like, what is, what is it that I was missing? And I don't think there really was anything other than the assurance that I was allowed to live in this body. Hmm. It's so interesting that you you share that because I think the myth of having to attain the thin ideal in order to have all these things fall into place in your life, like happiness or a partner who loves you and you're you know attracted to sexually and friends and social support, there's a myth that that is not attainable until you are in a thin body. And then even if everything in your life flies against that, it's so easy not to recognize it. Yeah. Absolutely. And I literally, I look around in the people that I think regularly today, like, I'm so lucky. My relationship with my husband is so amazing. We so adore each other, right? Like, and I, I focus on relationships a lot when I'm talking, because that, like you're saying, we consistently in culture tell fat men and fat women that relationships are not accessible to them, that they will not be loved and they will not be appreciated sexually, right? We, the culture is saying that all the time. And that is not my experience in my life. And I look around at the relationships that other people in my life have, people who, who are of every shape and size, and I tend to think I have the best relationship, right? <laughs> like, I tend to, uh, to feel like I have such a secure relationship, and the two of us adore each other so much, and it has nothing to do with body shape or size. And not to say that we're not attracted to each other, we are, but... The reason we're in love with each other is, as it should, is outside of body shape and size, right? Like, the thing about bodies is they're going to change, right? It doesn't matter if you are thin, medium, or fat, or you're going to, you know, encounter a disability because that happens to many of us, or you're just going to grow older. Bodies change. Yeah, it's that's such a great point and so important to remember. Like, it's not about the outer package. It's about the relationship that you have. I'm curious how you found your husband and how you how you sort of stumbled into this relationship that is so valuable, especially with struggling on your own with your your eating disorder and maybe not, I don't know if you were open with him about it or like if that was sort of a separate part of your life, but I'm curious to hear about how that affected your relationship and how your relationship was able to flourish even despite that. Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't think I really recognized that I had an eating disorder until I recovered from my eating disorder, right? Because until I had studied eating disorder and studied fat bodies, it didn't occur to me that somebody living in a fat body could go back and could be managing anorexia, (laughs) right? Like, because the culture does not tell you that that is an option, right? So And it was only looking backwards that I acknowledged that I allowed my relationship with food to control a lot for me and to be the space in which I felt control and joy about myself, right? So, you know, when I was controlling my caloric intake, I was proud of myself and I felt in control of my life. And when I wasn't controlling my caloric intake, I was disappointed in myself and felt out of control in my life, right? So I met my husband through computer dating, which is, again... I was raised to feel confident about my intelligence and my personality and all the elements of me that weren't physical, right? So I didn't have I didn't have the fear of dating that you see in some fat people. So for me I thought, well, you know, somebody will look past my larger body because the rest of me is great. But admittedly when I met my husband, I was on what I always call like the thin side of my spectrum. So 
I was usually when I was not in a relationship, I had a tendency to be on the thin side of my spectrum. And then during my relationships, I would gain weight because I was more comfortable in a relationship than out of it. Right. So the two of us just kind of clicked. I can't, I don't know how to explain that. Mm. (laughs) That's just the magic, right? Yeah. Yeah. The stuff that has nothing to do with your body or food or anything like that. Exactly. And admittedly, I do think there were in the, in the first couple of years of our marriage, there were definitely some struggles because there were things that I was putting off that were sort of hurting us both. So I'm pregnant now. It's been a long journey for me. We, we lost a number of, of, I had a number of miscarriages. I also lost a baby at five and a half months. But one of the reasons is because I'm older, right? So I'm 39 uh, in this pregnancy. I didn't start trying to get pregnant until I was 35. And while I was much healthier in my 30s than in my 20s when we met, I still was sort of getting better, right? And so in my early 30s, I couldn't imagine getting pregnant at the current body weight I was at, I felt I needed to be at a lower body weight in order to have a healthy pregnancy. My father is an obstetrician and and he did not force that on me, but I would read and I would think like, oh, it's unhealthy for people to be plus sized and be pregnant. I need to drop weight before I get pregnant. And I put off us having children for, you know, five or six years, because I wasn't thin enough. Which is so, I mean, the myth of that, right, that that, that is, it's so counterintuitive to actual reproductive science. <laughs> right. And age is a much bigger factor in reproductive science than body weight. Right. And also, if your body weight is suppressed and too low for you, you might not be producing enough estrogen to get pregnant as well. Right. Exactly. Well, and the and the other thing, of course, is that it's worth acknowledging that at 39, at a higher body weight, I've had a very, very normal pregnancy, knock on wood, and the you know that w- that's been very healthy. I had no gestational diabetes. I had because I had a regulated metabolism at this point. I had a very sort of normal weight gain, meaning I basically gained a baby (laughs) like with, mind you, no restriction during my pregnancy, meaning so when I had a craving for ice cream, I ate ice cream when I had, you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like I thought, oh, I'm not allowed to have those things, because I don't think like that anymore. And so I just ate when I was hungry. Do you know what I mean? I didn't get pregnant and think, oh, I'm now allowed to have whatever I want. You know what I mean? Like it, there was no switch in my brain. I was just now pregnant and continued to eat food. Yeah. It's interesting. I think a lot about that, the sort of pregnancy cravings, quote unquote, that people yeah. report having. And then there's this sort of cultural lore about it. And I think it really is because we live in diet culture and women are pushed to restrict every other time. But in pregnancy, it's sort of like, well, it's for the baby. Give the baby what it needs. And so right. there's this one little window where culturally we're sort of encouraged to give in quote unquote to these quote unquote cravings which like if you were having an intuitive relationship with food and every other time of your life it really doesn't happen and I've I've talked to a number of other people who have had that same experience you know that just like it's pretty similar to how they eat the rest of the time right right of course and there and there I do think there are like pregnancy driven cravings like in the beginning of my pregnancy all I wanted to eat was oranges, which, you know, in my regular life, I like oranges, but that's not what I'd like to eat for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Right? <laughs> right. So there are definitely moments where you're sort of physically driven towards specific foods. And, you know, my mind tends to think of listen to your body knowledge that like maybe my baby, I don't have enough vitamin C for my baby right now. You know what I mean? Like, but, you know, I listen to other women talk about what they eat during pregnancy, and they're all talking about, oh, I reverted to my childhood foods. I eat macaroni and cheese and ice cream and french fries. I'm like, yes, I had, the, I have had those things here and there along the way in my pregnancy. Listen, sometimes you wake up and you're like, man, I need pizza, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But in other moments in my life, my relationship with food these days are about what can I give my body that's going to give me energy that's going to make the day brighter? And I tend to 
one of the roads to intuitive eating for me was thinking about a rainbow of food, a round vision of nutrients. And somebody, I worked with an intuitive eating coach about two years ago, because I, I was trying to figure out like, how do I really focus on what my body needs, not just what it, well, how do I balance needs and wants, right? So we never, when I worked with this coach, we never talked about weight loss. We never talked about calories. We never talked about any of those things. This was just a question of getting, finding nutrients and thinking about nutrients. And her biggest piece of advice that I walked away with was try to eat a rainbow every day, right? And so when I don't want the rainbow, I don't force myself to eat it because that also was disordered, right? But really thinking about a rainbow of food was very helpful to me in my intuitive eating journey. So that's cool. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's, it's nice too, that a rainbow gives some visual pleasure and also yes. some different tastes and textures and flavors. Like it's something green. It's probably going to taste different than something red a lot of the time. Or right. <laughs> So, you know, it's like you get the sort of bitter, like green flavor and the maybe sweeter or sort of tart flavor of tomato or a pepper or something like that. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I like that approach to thinking about it. And it's interesting too thinking about the sort of later stages of intuitive eating where it sounds like you were really ready for the gentle nutrition part. What was that like for you sort of getting there? Did you go through a phase of feeling like I'm just going to eat whatever whenever I'm going to eat all the things that were restricted, which is sometimes what I call the honeymoon phase, or it's just like, woohoo, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and I think, I think everyone goes to that phase. So a lot of times when you're talking to activists, body positive and fat activists who've given up dieting, they all say, well, my, my weight balanced out, but they sort of skip over the part where they acknowledge that they gained weight in the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so I don't have a scale in my house. I, so I don't really know what my body weight is unless a doctor puts me on a scale. And even then I, often just say, you don't have to tell me, right? I don't, I don't really need to know. I understand the shape of my body. I'm actually much more familiar with my body than I was when I was trying to starve it, right? So I found that in the beginning of my intuitive eating journey, there definitely was a phase where my body got larger. And that was what you're calling the honeymoon phase, where I definitely was like, I'm going to eat all these things that I was never allowed to eat. And I'm going to try them all. And I'm going to eat them. And what a pleasure, right? And then once I gave myself the freedom to eat those foods, after a while, I could care less if I ate them or not. And not to say that I never ate them, but I, on a daily basis, I didn't need to eat them anymore. Right. They weren't like calling to you. Exactly. And so I then went through a period of time where I just was really, I got really into swimming. So, I, you know, I spent part of my intuitive eating journey was actually also an intuitive exercise journey. So I spent a lot of time being like, what is the exercise that I like? Because I used to do weightlifting and all this sort of cardio that people who are struggling with dieting do. And I, I would over-exercise and, and I hated every minute of it. Like going to the gym was a living nightmare. And one of the lessons I learned from the body positive movement was find exercise that you enjoy so that you, you don't just do it for your physical body, but you also do it for your mental health. That you, It's pleasure for you. And so I found that swimming laps was really meditative for me and that I loved it. And it was the place I went to calm my mind, to, to get away from the stress of trying to finish a movie and a PhD and a, right. And it was the place where I was at ease. And if you can, and you have the economic ability to do those things and you have the physical ability to do those things and you have access to that, that's great for anyone who can. But at the end of the day, we are not defined by a scale, right? That's the most important piece. Right. Yeah, we're not defined by a scale. We're not defined by what happens to our weight or by what behaviors we're able to do or not do. Absolutely. Yeah. And so how did you, you know, when you were going through the, the initial weight gain phase, how did you relate to your body then? How did you sort of make peace with that process given that you had, you know, spent so long trying to fight against weight gain or lose weight? I honestly don't think I came to intuitive eating until I already had accepted the size and shape of my body. Right. So, so I think a lot of people try to enter intuitive eating while they're still healing. Right. I think I had already reached a point where I accepted that my body weight was not something I could control. And so when I gained weight, I more than anything, I was, I was just like, Oh, I need 
newer, pretty clothes for this body. (laughs) You know what I mean? It was, I had decided that the healthiest thing for me to do was to never be on a diet again. Right. And so I didn't run into, I'm not saying that I loved my body every day because no one does. Right. What I'm saying is that I didn't run into, I'm a bad person because my body is getting bigger. I had put that down before I started thinking about intuitive eating. Yeah, that's huge. And that's when I work with clients, I find that the people who really click with intuitive eating and can really, you know, are really ready for change are the ones who've gone through a lot of body acceptance work already or just been listening to the podcast, reading, exploring the health at every size movement, exploring body acceptance and fat acceptance online and sort of immersing themselves in the ideas before coming to the eating part of it. And I think for some people, maybe it can they can go in tandem. And I definitely know people who've been able to kind of work through the body image issues while trying intuitive eating. But I think it's it's easier for sure if you're really committed to it. Yeah. So that's really that's really cool. And how long do you feel like it took you to sort of feel like you had your footing in intuitive eating? Oh, I think that's kind of a slippery slope, right? So I think that I really feel today like I almost never really think about my eating (laughs) which is, I mean, like I think about it in terms of things like right now, because I'm pregnant, I don't want a high salt intake because I feel like that's, that's not great for swelling and pregnancy, right? Like I find that intuitive eating is so second nature to me now that I don't even remember when that happened. (laughs) Right? It's, it's just like, it's almost like my, my relationship with food is sort of a non-entity at this point, right? There's no emotions in food anymore. Food is something I do to, when I'm hungry, I give my body food. Right. <laughs> right? It's, and I, again, I do think being an academic and being an activist had a lot to do with that because one of the things that I started to recognize is that I had wrapped food in morality. And it's not, right? We are not moral based on what foods we're eating. We're moral based in how kind or unkind we are in the world. And part of the world is ourselves. How kind or unkind are you to yourself, right? And so I just kind of said like, God, give yourself some slack. Bodies need food. Let go of all the judgment and all of the mental anguish that you're putting into food and start recognizing the joy that's found in food and the energy and the sort of magic that comes with food, right? I also love to cook. So I focused on that sometimes and how, how I could be creative with food, how I could, you know, really just finding what's good about food instead of what has tortured me about food. Yeah. Finding the pleasure in it. And it's, it's interesting too, that you say it's like a non-entity because that that's been my experience as well. And for many people who've really gotten the hang of intuitive eating, it feels like it's suddenly just not an issue. I mean, not suddenly, you know, it sort of creeps up or who knows when it yeah. actually happens. But I think it that speaks to the fact that we're all born as intuitive eaters. We all have the capacity to eat intuitively. And once we sort of step back into that, and maybe it's something like muscle memory or something kicks in, you know, that we we start to feel really in sync with these natural instincts. And it's it's just easy. Like it, there's no more fight. Well, yeah, that's exactly it. Well, and there's also, there's definitely something to be said for the things people used to say around dieting, like, oh, I can't have a cookie because then I'll eat them all. Or I can't, I can't open the bag of chips because I'll eat the whole bag. Right. And I got that when I was a dieter, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Like I I so agreed with that. And then now that I'm, I'm not in that place in my life, my body doesn't want that. So like we can have a bag of chips in this house for two months. You just, you know, I eat a few chips and then I'm like, all right, I'm chipped out. You know what I mean? Like it just, it doesn't, you you might want the taste of a couple, but you're not interested in a whole bag. It just doesn't, and you don't, it's not a conscious choice. You're just like, stop, like you have a couple of chips and then you're like watching the TV show or back to work and you don't even think about eating chips anymore, right? Like it's right. You have enough and you move on. Right. Yeah. No, I feel that way too. It's, I used to 
totally identify with that sentiment of like, oh, there's certain foods I'll just never be able to keep in the house and really believed that because the experience I had with them was so negative for years. But of course, it's funny that I I didn't really believe like when I was a child, I had I didn't have those experiences. You know, we would have chips and cereal and cookies and things that I thought were so binge worthy when I was in my dieting and restrictive times. But, you know, as a kid it was like those things could be there for months, too. And I would never finish off the whole bag in one sitting or whatever. So once I sort of came back to intuitive eating, I'm like, oh, right. It's it's very much like when I was a kid. I just have food around all kinds of different foods that I might want at any given time. But they don't sit there and call to me from the cupboard anymore. <laughs> like I can forget about them for a while, you know, be like, oh, right. forgot we had this candy. I'm excited to eat it now. But I literally did not think about it for a couple of weeks, you know. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's cool. And so tell me about your career trajectory a little bit, sort of where that fits in with all of this. So sort of at the same time that I was going through all the my self-healing and my relationship with food, I was getting this PhD in something called comparative studies, which is basically like a liberal arts PhD where you design your own course of study. And my course of study was very focused on media representations, literary representations, and social justice. So the advisors that I worked with were people who worked on disability theory, feminist theory, literary representations and media representations. And I, I initially started off working on representations of teenagers. So I wrote like about the Hunger Games and Twilight and how these were, you know, positive or negative representations of teenagers, particularly teenage women, for teenage women to be you know, accessing these representations and what they were learning from these representations. And as is life, eventually when you're doing this kind of academic work, you start to see your own sort of reflection in the work you're doing. And I definitely started to say like, wow, there is definitely some body image issue stuff going on in representations of young women. So the more I studied those representations, the more I started to realize that like this was what I was going to need to focus on because it was personal for me. And I was really invested in the idea of body image and, and how it had affected me as a young one. And so I, I started to do this work on my dissertation initially, when I first, when I first came to this work was about young adult representations, both in the media, like on TV and in movies and in young adult novels, and how fat bodies were treated, particularly women's bodies. And I was working on that for a little while and there was some stuff going on in my life. And I was like, this is stuff is so important. And it's not just an important to teenage women that like, and that's one of the things we do in the culture that I, that I think is upsetting is we have a tendency to think that like the projection of body image issues is at people who either understand they're dealing with eating disorder or are kids or teenagers, right? We like tend to look at marginally healthy adult women and men and be like, well, you're an adult, you can handle your body image issues, right? And the truth is that that's not really true, right? Like our body image issues at every age in all stages of life need to be addressed. And anybody who could have their eyes open to this information would be helped by having this information in their lives. And so I contacted my friend, one of my best friends, Viri, and I was like, we should make a movie about body image and in particular about representations of fat bodies and how much prejudice there is in the culture. And she was like, that's a really good idea. We should do that. And then, you know, we kind of like hung out and had some wine and said we should do that a whole bunch of times. And then a year and a half later, I was going to New York and she just moved to New York. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to be in New York a week for a week this summer. Let's do like an interview or two on camera and see like if this would work. And we didn't really know what we were doing at that time. So we were thinking like, oh, we want to make a movie, but maybe we want to make an educational movie. Maybe I don't know what we're doing. Like, what are we doing? But we'll film these interviews and see what happens. And we interviewed Claire Misko, who is now the chief operating officer of NIDA, the National Eating Disorder Association. And we interviewed Substantia Jones, who is a photo activist. She takes portraits of fat bodies, often nude or sometimes dressed, 
and couples just trying to show the beauty in different shapes. And we had conversations with both of these women on camera. And, and when these two interviews were complete, we walked out of these two interviews and we looked at each other and we were just like, this is going to be incredible. This is going to be amazing. We have to do this because there's so much happening here that is just not being said. And when I say not being said, what I mean is we talk about photoshopping. We talk about body image in what I would call in-betweeners or medium-sized bodies, women who are on the higher end of the under plus size sizing. But we very rarely talk about the injustice that fatness faces in the culture. Yeah, especially not in mainstream body positivity circles. Yeah, it's not happening. Actually, Jess Baker this week wrote the Frank body positivity. Yes, I just had her on the podcast this week and sh- and we linked to that article and we talked about that article. It was amazing. Yeah, well, and that's exactly like we have, we're watering down body positivity to where it's not, we're not actually recognizing the cultural problem we're recognizing part of the problem, but we're not recognizing that the culture is terrified of fatness and particularly fatness that registers as plus sized, right? We're terrified of that. And because we're terrified of it, we mistreat it. And it's, it's a legitimate social justice issue, right? So fat people experience economic inequality. They experience different treatment in the medical world and assumptions about them from the medical world that are usually bias and not based in facts, right? They also experience just the pure idea of if you're living in a plus size body and you're a teenager, you don't fit in your desk at school, right? Like just straightforward systemic accommodation issues. And, you know, and it's, I don't know, we, my husband had a conference out in San Francisco and he fronted the seed money for Fatitude. And we, it's, we're really kind of a renegade film crew. So we, (laughs) you know, we filmed in people's houses and in hotel rooms. And we, we went out to San Francisco while he was in his conference. And we did it 13, what we call the original 13 interviews. And then we released Fatitude's trailer onto the internet to raise some money on Kickstarter. And you know, from there, it's kind of an explosion. So we, we went, our trailer went viral. It's so good. Thanks. I love the people you talk to. It was a, pr- a passion project. It's taken us a lot more time than we expected. We did it around me getting a PhD and Viri having a full-time job, right? So we have a multitude of commitments. We are a team of two. We filmed, we interviewed, we edited the whole thing, right? Nobody else was involved with the exception of a handful of fantastic interns, although they mostly did social media stuff for us. And these days, we have an incredible social media manager who is, her name is Melissa Maza. She's also a body positive activist who I love so very much. But just to be perfectly clear, there is not one person in Fatitude's team that has taken a dime home, right? So no one has ever been paid for the jobs they do for this work, right? So, and we, you know, we made this movie and it premiered on May 9th of this year at the Vancouver Documentary Film Festival. And it premiered to a standing ovation. And it, you know, it's, I, well, it's somewhere in the next six to eight months, we'll see a, a release for easy access for people. So, a, you know, meaning it's some kind of a streaming release so that people can actually watch the movies in, in their homes kind of a thing. We're still sort of doing the theater thing right now. We have a couple of screenings that we're discussing New York, LA, San Francisco, that kind of thing. Ooh, let me know about New York. I'm so there. I de- Well, New York is the one that is <laughs> the most solidified so far. So New York is going to be attached to the Binge Eating Disorder Association's conference. Yes, in November. Right. We're going to try to raise some money for BETA by selling tickets to a Fatitude screening. That's fantastic. Yes, I am very excited about it. But that, yeah, and, you know, and I'm going to be a brand new mom who's bringing her child. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that'll be so, so interesting. Yeah, but it's, but absolutely, it's the work of Fatitude and my own personal body image and fat activism has just sort of grew organically, right? It was, it came from living this life and then being an academic and then making this film, all of which were just out of the passion to see the world change about this topic. That's so awesome. It's amazing what a passion project can become. Yeah. 
Yeah, it really is. So yeah, tell us more about who's in the film and what it covers and all of that good stuff. Yeah. So the main focus of Fatitude is to really think about how media representations enable culture to act with cruelty towards fatness without us even realizing that's happening. Meaning that often when we represent fat bodies, they are monsters, they're jokes, they're asexual, or we're laughing at their hypersexuality that is unwelcome. And then at the same time, we're looking at some other media representations like The Biggest Loser, which I've actually just heard may have been canceled. (gasps) Oh, that would be amazing. After 13 or 14 years of torturing the planet, they may have been canceled. Thank God. (laughs) you know, but we, we look at, at, at how, you know, one of the quotes we have about the biggest loser in the film is Reagan Chastain, who is a fat activist, talks about the fact that if the biggest loser was animals, it would have been canceled in two weeks, right? So really trying to understand how we accept the mistreatment of fat people in the culture, and really sort of looking at that, we also get into sort of the questions of, systemic prejudice, the the injustices and the statistics that are evolved around those injustices. And then we spend the last 20 minutes of the film talking about solutions and how we could do something different. The film features like 48 voices or something like that. We did a total of 50 interviews and I think we, 48 of them actually made it to the final cut of the film, but they are a collection of people from sort of all the different elements of the things that we're touching on. So We have psychologists, we have fat activists, we have body positive activists, we have actors and directors from Hollywood. Ricky Lake is in the film. Tess Holliday, the the plus size model, is in the film, as well as Alex LaRosa, who is also a plus size model. We have a plus size stylist in the film, right? So the film covers sort of what I would call fat activism 101, right? There's a whole gamut of conversation happening. But for us, the thread line was, how does representation of larger bodies allow for prejudice in the culture? And how can we change representation so that it allows for body acceptance in the culture? Mm -hmm. Such an important mission because representation is how people sort of absorb by osmosis these ideas about fat bodies that then allow them to enact prejudice on other people. So if we can start shifting the cultural representations and the the norms around how fat bodies are represented, it could really make a huge difference in people's internalized weight stigma or weight stigma towards other people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I just wrote an article for CNN that I, I really do think the fat activist and the body positive movement are starting to gain momentum. I don't think that the majority of people on the planet have engaged with the body activists or the fat activist movements. But I do think that we're starting to see news articles about women and men who don't take the kind of prejudice they're experiencing sitting down. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's a really powerful cultural shift because people living in fat bodies often until very recently The majority of them felt, and I would still say the majority do, that they don't deserve respect because they perceive their relationship with their body as if they don't respect their own body, right? And so, you know, the reality of it is, no, this is our fatitude tagline. Everybody deserves respect, period. You should respect everyone you meet. They taught us that in kindergarten, (laughs) Like, We should start from there. Yeah. Going back to what you were saying about morals and being a good person, right? Being kind to everyone you meet. It's literally that simple. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. (sighs) Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love all of this, and I can't wait to see the film. Can you tell us where people can find it and learn more information about when screenings might be coming to their city? Yes, absolutely. So you can learn more about Fatitude. We also provide excessive resources on great books to read, great websites to visit, and information about what's forthcoming with Fatitude on our website, which is www.fatitudethemovie.com. And we also have a very active Facebook page, which, you know, if you type Fatitude the Movie into Facebook, it, it pops up first. That's awesome. And on that Facebook page, we post or we curate articles. We don't actually 
write a lot of articles, but it's a great resource to find what's happening in the body positive and fat activist world on a daily basis. So we post articles about injustice that we see as memes, as well as, you know, great articles about plus size fashion for both men and women, just a place where if you're trying to find positive representation about larger bodies, Fatitude's Facebook page is a great place to start. And we post a lot of information about the people who are in our film so that you, you get a chance to sort of meet them and the activism that they're doing. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm going to link to all of that in the show notes so people can find it and would definitely encourage everyone to go check it out. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us, Lindsay. It's a pleasure talking with you. Absolutely. You too. This was fun. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to our guest, Lindsay Averill, for being here. And thanks to you all for listening. To get full show notes from this episode, including all the resources we discussed, you can head over to christyharrison.com slash 120 for episode 120. That's christyharrison.com slash 120. This episode was brought to you by my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. It's a 13-week course to help you master intuitive eating, give up dieting for good, and make peace with your body. Learn more and sign up at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. The music you're hearing behind me now is by a band called AWOL, and the track is called Food, used under the Creative Commons license. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Stupid or scared, no work in the kitchen now.